This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers, and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. So today's guest knows better than most what persecution at the hands of intelligence agencies and the political class feels like. He's a veteran of eight national presidential campaigns. He spent hours talking politics with President Nixon as a confidant and advisor in his post-presidential years. He's a legendary political operative who served as a senior campaign aide to Nixon, Reagan, Senator Bob Dole, and is a close friend and advisor to President Donald Trump. This background has given him a better insight and inside information to what actually happened to President John F. Kennedy. He's the New York Times bestselling author of The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. Roger Stone, welcome to the show, sir. Jeremy, great to be with you. So for those not familiar with you, Roger, I know I kind of gave a brief uh, introduction of yourself, but if you just want to let everyone know um, a little bit about who Roger Stone is and and what you do, sir. Uh, Sure. Uh, Although, thanks to CNN, I guess you'd have to be living under a rock uh, to have no idea. Uh, I'm uh, actually a veteran of 11 national presidential campaigns, beginning, oh, apologies. With, beginning with Richard Nixon, uh, working for three presidential campaigns for uh, the great Ronald Reagan, 1976, 1980, <clears throat> 1984. Uh, and of course, I began trying to convince Donald Trump to run for president as early as 1988, again in 2000, again in 2012. And then finally, successfully in 2016. Uh, I am particularly proud of the fact that I'm a New York Times bestselling author. My book, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ, I think makes a compelling case using eyewitness evidence, fingerprint evidence, deep Texas politics, uh, that uh, Lyndon Johnson is the man who had the motive, means, and opportunity to kill John F. Kennedy. Uh, In fact, I think if you read that book, you will come away with the overwhelming conviction that that is the case. Uh, I do a daily show called Stone Zone, The Stone Zone, uh, at stonezone.live every day at five o'clock Eastern. Uh, And now that I have uh, been taken out of Twitter jail, um, where I was banned for life in 2017, um, with the notoriety that comes with a two-year witch hunt uh, at the hands of Robert Mueller in the deep state, Uh, my show has really taken off in a very positive way. So I would urge your followers, uh, folks who uh, watch you, to tune in 5 o'clock Eastern every day at stonezone.com, pardon me, stonezone.live, and check it out. I know you've, you've also done some great uh, Twitter spaces that I've been actually riveted by, and with Grant Cardone and a few other people as well. Um, but Roger, for, for those people listening, um, I really want to focus on, on your book um, about the Kennedy assassination today. I've been, I've been reading it. I'm not 100% done with it, but I am absolutely riveted in the background information. So for those listening, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, your connection with President Nixon and how this kind of gave you some insight um, into the Kennedy assassination. So tell our audience a little bit about, um, you know, those conversations with President Nixon and really what got sure. you looking at this. Uh, in order to understand um, uh, the the dynamics involved in the murder of John F. Kennedy, uh, you really need to read two of my books, uh, Nixon's Secrets, um, which Uh, really lays out the truth about Watergate and the man who killed Kennedy, uh, the case against LBJ, because Watergate uh, and the Kennedy assassination are related. It's Mm -hmm. not incidental uh, that four of the Watergate burglars were on the scene in Dealey Plaza in 1963. So four of the Watergate burglars arrested in 1972 were actively involved in the Kennedy assassination in 1963. Uh, At least three of the Watergate burglars uh, were on the Central Intelligence 
agency payroll uh, and reporting to their handlers during the Watergate break-in. How coincidental. Mm -hmm. uh, very recently, um, I unearthed a long overlooked Watergate era tape, uh, which you can hear President Richard Nixon uh, meeting with the CIA director, Richard Helms, uh, basically threatening him, saying, wow. let me quote, I know who shot John, he says, and it could become a very vigorous issue. Uh, you can count on me to cover up for the agency. It's a threat uh, and, uh, and a not very thinly veiled one. Uh, with these two new tranches uh, of uh, classified information, the first, uh, uh, the first uh, amount declassified by President Donald Trump, more recently data declassified by President Joe Biden, both presidents still holding about 20 percent back uh, from the American people, uh, we get closer and closer to the fact that the Central Intelligence Agency was a central player uh, in the murder of John F. Kennedy. Their mm -hmm. motives are very clear. Um, they were unhappy with his handling of the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, they were unhappy uh, with his handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis because they knew in real time um, that John and Robert Kennedy didn't face Nikita Khrushchev down, who then removed the missiles from Cuba. We made a secret deal to remove our missiles from Turkey uh, in Italy, uh, changing the balance of power in the European theater uh, in return for a pledge by Khrushchev, uh, never actualized, to remove the missiles uh, from Cuba. What really got me started, as you point out, uh, on this entire uh, venture uh, was a conversation I had with President uh, Nixon in, I guess it was 1989. Uh, now, Nixon was a very uh, private man, very buttoned down, very circumspect, uh, very, very, very forward looking. I mean, he was disinterested in, uh, uh, in the past uh, and very, very focused on the future. It's hard to get him to talk about some of the even great events uh, of, the, of history that he had witnessed or been a party to. So you couldn't get him to talk about his uh, kitchen debate with Khrushchev or, mm -hmm. or being attacked by communist mobs uh, in Caracas, Venezuela, uh, or the debate with John Kennedy, uh, or his relationship with Dwight Eisenhower, uh, who he served for eight years as vice president or his clash uh, with Senator Joe McCarthy. Uh, but um, when Nixon had a couple drinks, uh, when he got- <laughs> I find your he, description of, of, of his uh, martini, he, don't, he wouldn't need very much and he'd loosen up very quickly. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he would become positively loquacious uh, after a couple of drinks. Uh, and um, uh, on one of those occasions where he was uh, mixing cocktails and I was helping him drink them, uh, I asked him directly, uh, who killed John Kennedy? He, he stared into his drink for a moment. He looked up at me and he said, let me say this. The Warren Commission was the biggest goddamn hoax in American history. Wow. And he continued to stare into his drink. Uh, then I said, yes, but who really killed Kennedy? He looked at me again and he said, let me put it to you this way. Lyndon and I both wanted to be president the difference was I wasn't willing to kill for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, from that point on that I decided that I was going to research the Kennedy assassination. Uh, and I came to the stunning conclusion, uh, as I lay out in my book, uh, that it was Johnson who was staring uh, at two uh, ongoing corruption investigations, the Billy Salestis uh, investigation Billy Salestis was a flamboyant Texas Wheeler dealer. Johnson had gotten him multi-million dollar agriculture uh, contracts. He was kicking back to Johnson tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and also the Bobby Baker scandal. Baker was the uh, Senate Sergeant of Arms. He was Johnson's right-hand man, essentially Johnson's bag man. Both of them under intense investigation in 1963. In fact, the Senate hearings into Baker's uh, abuses and corruption actually opened on November 22nd, 1963. Uh, Johnson was on the phone throughout that day to see uh, when and if his name would come up. 
uh, he was a man staring in the into the abyss. Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy had the president's brother, who was attorney general, had begun telling people that Johnson would be dropped from the 1964 ticket and would likely be going to prison. So wow. uh, for LBJ, it was kill or be killed. Now, uh, in the JFK researcher community, um, there are uh, a lot of competing theories. There are a lot of competing loyalties. There are a lot of people who are certain that they have the one and only answer. So, for example, there are those who say, oh, Kennedy was killed by the CIA. Well, they're not wrong. Mm -hmm. There are others who say, no, Kennedy was killed by organized crime. Well, they're not wrong either. Um, there are others who say, well, Kennedy's murder was engineered by Big Texas Oil. They're actually correct also. Um, there is still others who say because of his commitment uh, to a silverback dollar or a goldback dollar, mm -hmm. Kennedy's case, he preferred silver. Uh, Kennedy's murder was engineered by the big banks. Well, they're not wrong either. The point, of course, is that Lyndon Johnson uh, is the common spoke between uh, all of these entities. When Johnson was the uh, majority leader of the U.S. Senate, he takes uh, the uncommon step of appointing himself uh, to the subcommittee of the Defense Appropriations Committee, where the Central Intelligence Agency's black box budgets are secretly prepared and approved. Lyndon Johnson is the paymaster for the CIA. Uh, he is involved in the CIA's expansion uh, after Truman signs them into law uh, in 1950. Mm -hmm. uh, he is also uh, an intimate uh, of his next door neighbor, uh, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, Hoover uh, knew that he was facing mandatory retirement in 1964 under President John F. Kennedy. He knew that Robert Kennedy was ready to show him the door uh, and only the president can waive that mandatory requirement. Uh, so Hoover had a, an, an, not only a, a hatred for the Kennedys, uh, but also an inherent interest in their removal. Mm -hmm. uh, Johnson was uh, being paid by Carlos Marcello, uh, the mob boss of Texas, uh, to protect uh, illegal gambling operations in Houston and Dallas uh, and San Antonio. So Johnson was on the pad to Marcello. Marcello had financed a number of Johnson's early presidential campaigns. Uh, Johnson was uh, very connected uh, to uh, Wall Street through Elliot Janeway, a well-known columnist uh, investor. Uh, and uh, he knew uh, that Wall Street uh, and the banks were ready to move to paperback money, uh, fiat currency that is uh, currently uh, destroying our economy. Yeah. So uh, Johnson is, has a common spoke to all of the entities, uh, including Big Texas Oil, uh, where, you know, uh, John and Robert Kennedy want to repeal the oil depletion allowance, uh, costing the Texas oil billionaires uh, hundreds of millions of dollars more in taxes. Uh, Johnson is the, is the common uh, thread throughout this, I hate to use it, conspiracy. Now, we've all seen the famous picture of Lyndon Johnson uh, with his hand up, taking the oath of office on uh, Air Force One. Why, why is he doing that? Mm -hmm. uh, there's no legal necessity for that. Uh, the instant the president is, de is legally declared dead, the vice president is automatically a president of the United States with the full powers of that office. So there was no reason for that ceremony other than to twist the knife in Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. LBJ actually calls Bobby Kennedy back in Washington and says, get me the oath of office. I'm going to take the oath. He is twisting the knife in Robert Kennedy. Well, I think uh, that's one of the really interesting things, Roger, is like, you know, even reading um, Jim Mars's book, Crossfire, the Plot that Killed Kennedy. I know you referenced Jim Mars uh, a bit in your book. He seems to, for the most part, leave LBJ alone, which is interesting because – he really is this uniting thread for a lot of things because there's this back and forth between Bobby Kennedy and LBJ, this back and forth between Bobby Kennedy um, and uh, Hoover. So there's a lot of kind of antagonism behind the scenes. But without LBJ, I, I don't think any of this works. Well, uh, look, I had great respect for Jim Mars, and I do uh, use his book uh, with uh, with uh, accreditation uh, in yep. my uh, in in my book. Um, but uh, even Oliver Stone, after he read my book 
sent me a note saying that he wished he had read my book prior to making his movie JFK because he really didn't understand the central role that Lyndon Johnson plays in the entire drama. Uh, cui bono, as they say in Latin, who benefits? All of those entities I talked about had an interest in the removal of John Kennedy, but one man's removal was acute. The man who was under scrutiny by the U.S. Senate for corruption that very day. Uh, and um, we now know, in retrospect, uh, that Drew Pearson, the single most influential columnist uh, of the day, uh, had uh, s had uh, scheduled a column for Sunday, the 23rd, uh, that exposed Lyndon Johnson for taking a payoff in return for the delivery of a major defense contract to General Dynamics. That was the end of the line for LBJ, uh, mm -hmm. and he knew it. So um, at this point, the Warren Commission uh, story narrative is completely discredited. Um, I have a column at my new Substack coming out here shortly, um, which I prove to you that Warren Commission member Gerald Ford, then a congressman from Michigan, uh, later president of the United States, uh, at the suggestion of J. Edgar Hoover uh, and former CIA director Alan Dulles, physically changes the official autopsy diagram, taking a pencil uh, and moving the depiction of a wound in Kennedy's upper back uh, to the back of his neck uh, to accommodate the government's completely phony uh, magic bullet theory. The idea that John Kennedy was shot three times, all from the back, there are only three shots. Uh, first of all, no government sharpshooter of any uh, uh, talent or quality uh, or ranking has ever been able to duplicate uh, those three shots within the time sequence required. Uh, and secondarily, 13 doctors and nurses see an entry wound in John F. Kennedy's throat uh, when they take him to Parkland Hospital. They immediately perform a tracheotomy uh, to uh, be able to disguise that as a, an entry wound from the back rather than an entry wound from the front. There's also a blowout wound in the black uh, on the right rear of Kennedy's head, the size of a grapefruit. Um, by the time the body uh, gets to Bethesda Medical Center uh, in Washington, um, that has been repaired. There's no notation in the autopsy Although the doctors, particularly Dr. Crenshaw, the emergency room doctor in Dallas, records seeing it in his book, as do multiple other physicians uh, and nurses. Mm -hmm. So um, the bottom line, of course, is that Kennedy is shot multiple times. There are more than three bullets. He is shot from the front uh, and the back. Uh, and this uh, continues to be concealed from the American people. What's interesting is uh, that even today, 73% uh, of the people in a Gallup poll that's taken yearly do not believe that, that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone uh, and are not certain uh, that he was the assassin. So I, I, I want to get back to this in just a second because I also want to talk about the, the Jack Ruby, Jack Rubenstein uh, you know, uh, conundrum. But I, I want to talk a little bit about LBJ as a person because I think hi historically – you know, we hear about like, you know, he helped with civil rights and we don't really hear about who Johnson was as a person. And when I read your book, it's Roger, it's a little bit shocking. LBJ, the person, he sounds totally unelectable. So I guess well, this is what Lyndon Johnson was a functioning lunatic. I mean, mm. he was a deeply uh, uh, flawed man. He was uh, an alcoholic. He was a pill popper. Uh, he was a, a sadist. Uh, he was uh, he was uh, a coward, a physical coward. Um, they called him Lion Linden for a reason. He stole his election uh, to the Senate uh, in a corrupt deal uh, involving one particular county uh, and a group of corrupt figures uh, by 48 votes. Um, when I say he was a sadist, uh, he, he liked to conduct White House staff meetings while sitting on the toilet defecating, uh, which he did to humiliate, um, you know, the... Ivy League aides that he had uh, inherited from John F. Kennedy. Um, he didn't just do it because he was crude. Uh, he did it because he could. Yeah. Uh, he was a shameless womanizer. Uh, he was an egomaniac. Uh, he was epically corrupt. Uh, no major piece of legislation, no appropriation 
uh, moved in the 1950s uh, without a payoff to Lyndon Johnson. Uh, he managed to become fabulously wealthy uh, as a member of the U.S. Senate. I think it was President Harry Truman who said, show me a man who gets rich in politics and I'll show you a crook. Um, he, he was a crook, but he was mentally unbalanced. Uh, uh, this is, I think, one of the more interesting things about my book. It is not only uh, an explanation of what happened uh, in the murder of John F. Kennedy, but it's a it's an accurate portrait of the unhinged lunatic uh, that uh, Lyndon Johnson was. Civil rights, he killed every civil rights piece of legislation through the fifth through the fifties. Uh, as a Senate Majority Leader, he killed every Voting Rights Act, he killed every Open Housing Act, and so on. In 1958, uh, he engineers the opposition to the 1958 Civil Rights Bill but he doesn't put his name on the Southern Manifesto. He merely writes it. That's because he was planning to run for president in 1960. Uh, and he knew that uh, uh, that black Americans were a growingly important constituency in the Democratic Party. Uh, not as big a, a constituency as they would come after uh, the Great Society, after his social programs. He was, of course, the first president to dip into the Social Security, Security Trust Fund, uh, almost all of the country's economic, structural economic problems today can be traced back to the financial shenanigans of Lyndon Johnson. No, he was not a great uh, uh, proponent of civil rights. He was a lifelong segregationist. Uh, and uh, he very famously said, I'll have those N-word voting Democratic for the next hundred years. So this was all uh, this was all politics uh, to him. Uh, he is, uh, without any question, uh, probably our worst president. So in, in terms of that, then, like, I, I, I know there's kind of the organized crime background of, you know, the, the organized crime helped Kennedy get elected, but then Bobby Kennedy turns against organized crime. So there's antagonism going on there. So I guess how do these threads come together then with Johnson? Like, like how does how does this thing go down, Roger? Well, as you correctly point out, um, Ambassador Joseph P. Kennedy, uh, very controversial, had served as Franklin Roosevelt's ambassador uh, to uh, Great Britain, uh, was partners with Frank Costello in the bootlegging business, controlled the illegal liquor trade from New York all the way up to the Canadian border. Uh, and uh, he went to the mob chieftains in Chicago and a big... Uh, conclave and said that he wanted a million dollars. Uh, and in return uh, from the help of the mob, both financially and in terms of twisting arms to elect John Kennedy uh, in 1960, um, that he would uh, see that the deportation proceedings against Carlos Marcelo and Santo Traficante, uh, two major mob bosses uh, of the era, would be dropped. After the election, uh, Robert Kennedy became attorney general, uh, John Kennedy's brother, Joe Kennedy's other son, youngest son, a uh, younger son. Uh, and um, Kennedy, rather than keep the deal, uh, went after Marcello uh, and uh, Traficante extremely aggressively in an attempt to deport them from the country. So the mob was double crossed. But Johnson uh, is being paid by the mob, uh, specifically by a man named Jack Halfer. How do we know this? Halfer would be convicted on some other minor crime, and he was uh, pardoned on November 23rd, 1963. Wow. So uh, Johnson is connected uh, to the mob. Johnson is connected to Big Texas Oil. Johnson is connected to the CIA. Johnson is connected to the uh, to the FBI. Uh, the the Secret Service director, uh, John Rowley. Uh, the first man to bound up the stairs at Air Force, uh, at Andrews Air Force Base to embrace the new president, Lyndon Johnson, got his first job in government from Congressman Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and um, as I write in my book, all of these actors within government rationalize the murder of Kennedy because they're all aware of Kennedy's uh, drug addiction. They're all aware of the fact that, that John Kennedy uh, is being treated by a doctor in New York called Dr. Max Jacobson, 
uh, who was using that sent me down a whole rabbit hole, by the way, Roger. I, I, I had no, my, uh, I ended up talking to my dad about it. He's, he's in his sixties and you know, he's all about Dr. Feelgood. And I was like, really surprised the number of lives this guy ruined. Like when you look at the number of celebrities connected to him. Yeah. Dr. Max Jacobson is a New York practicing physician, uh, who has a very early proprietary blend of what is in fact crystal meth. Uh, he is, uh, uh, he's attending Frank Sinatra. He's attending Mar uh, Maria Calais, the opera singer, Leonard Bernstein, the conductor, Aristotle Onassis, the billionaire, Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York. Uh, all of these people believe that they're being treated with a blend of uh, vitamins and enzymes that is increasing their energy. None of them realize that they're being given, uh, you know, uh, uh, essentially uh, amphetamines. Uh, that are jacking them up. But John Kennedy, because of his uh, war injuries, has a terrible problem with the with pain. He has difficulty walking. He's required to wear a back brace. Uh, yet we history now records that he is uh, chasing after 18 year old interns uh, and that he is, uh, to say the least, uh, sexually extraordinarily reckless, uh, more reckless than even Bill Clinton, if wow. such a thing is possible. <laughs> I think this is attributable uh, to his uh, drug addiction, uh, but you can see how the intelligence services rationalize this. Oh my God, the man's a drug addict. He may give away the store. He may make these concessions to Nikita Khrushchev. Uh, he could uh, he could sell the country out to Russia. We have to remove him. There's an entire book on this, by the way, entitled Dr. Feelgood. I recommend it uh, because I know how this works. There are liberals out there saying, oh, I saw Roger Stone on with Jeremy Slate, and he was making up all kinds of stuff about John Kennedy. Now, this is all very heavily documented. Uh, in fact, when President Kennedy goes to Vienna for the uh, for the summit with Nikita Khrushchev, Jacobson's name can be found on the manifest uh, mm -hmm. in the presidential traveling party. He was an attending physician. That's because he was shooting John Kennedy up on that trip. Uh, and it is recorded that uh, Kennedy... Um, was disturbed because Khrushchev kept delaying the beginning of the meeting. So um, Kennedy required multiple injections to quote unquote, keep his edge. Wow. Uh, and at a certain point, Dr. Jacobson began to become concerned that Kennedy could uh, overdose. Uh, and therefore he had the president sign a waiver, uh, giving him uh, uh, immunity uh, if there was some deleterious side effect. So um, I, I think that uh, the fact that the Secret Service uh, and the FBI were well aware of the fact of Kennedy's addiction uh, and that he was being treated by Jacobson uh, is used to rationalize his murder uh, in the name of national security. This episode is sponsored by My Pillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York on a ski vacation, and uh, I actually have an extra my pillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, <clears throat> you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% of select products at MyPillow.com, up to 66% of select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the my pillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So if you guys want to join me on the Parasite Cleanse, and uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with, <clears throat> you can head over to bravetv.store slash CYOL. Um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash CYOL. 
Do you think addiction, I don't know if you've seen the new Elvis Presley movie. It was uh, kind of interesting. There's this doctor, Dr. Nicolopoulos, and uh, he's basically helping Elvis just shoot up all the time. And it was part of the problem with him. And I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, you know, looking at, you know, obviously that shows situations like this happen, because I think this might be slightly unbelievable to people, but this happens. And I guess looking at it, do you think that was part of a control mechanism, right? Like how they don't want celebrities to leave. Do you think in this case, getting JFK addicted to drugs was a control mechanism for someone? I don't know if it's, you know, the intelligence agencies, who, whoever it may be. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we know that uh, Robert Kennedy became aware of the treatments that Dr. Jacobson was giving to John Kennedy, uh, that he got a hold of some of the medication, sent it out to an FBI lab. They told him what it really was. Uh, he confronted his brother and said, look, the stuff is going to kill you. Uh, it's really bad for you. Uh, and John Kennedy said, look, I don't care if it's horse piss. It makes me feel better. I mean, you have to recognize the gravity of John Kennedy's war wounds. He was a genuine uh, war hero. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I don't know that um, that he was, uh, uh, I, I don't know that, uh, that Jack Kennedy didn't find Dr. Feelgood on his own. Mm -hmm. I think in this particular case, those who murdered him actually used uh, his uh, drug use as a rationale. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the new Elvis movie. I'm very anxious. You should see definitely it. see it. Like it, it's really interesting because it's kind of like it, it gives you the idea of like what people that control celebrities are like. It's it's dark, but but the guy that plays Elvis is really good. Um, yeah, check it out. But anyway, the, the thing I wanted to get into then, Roger, is, is the whole idea of Jack Ruby, because his character in this whole thing is, is just odd. And yes. um, you can correct me if I'm wrong at this, but there was actually um, he was also known as Jack Rubenstein, and he also had a connection to Johnson, if that's correct. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's very interesting. Uh, obviously, Jack Ruby is seen on national television uh, murdering Lee Harvey Oswald, essentially to silence him. Uh, what does Oswald say when he is apprehended, when he is in public? He, st he yells, I'm a patsy, he says. I didn't shoot anyone. And indeed, um, there are no nitrates, no powder burns uh, on, on Oswald's chest or on his arm. So we're asked to believe that he had shot this leaky $29 Italian mail order rifle, uh, an army carbine. Uh, Carcano rifle, yet there's no evidence he shot a gun that day. There alone is evidence that he is not the shooter. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Warren Commission tells us that Jack Ruby has no known association with organized crime. Uh, this is a joke because Jack Ruby's club, the Carousel Club, is owned by Carlos Marcello. Right. Uh, Ruby had worked as a button man, uh, had run casinos in Cuba, for Marcello uh, had been a uh, had strong arm people for the mob in Chicago. When uh, Richard Nixon uh, is watching, like the rest of America, is watching the the scene unfold on television in his New York apartment, according to Nick Rui, uh, now deceased, who was a uh, uh, traveling aide to uh, Kennedy up to uh, Nixon. Uh, Nixon sees Ruby on the screen jumps out of his chair and says, I know that man. Uh, I, I know that man. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, as a congressman, um, had brought Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, uh, to, uh, to Richard Nixon and said, uh, look, Dick, you have some excess budget money on the House on american Activities Committee budget. I would really like uh, Rubenstein to be picked up as a committee informant. Um, he's got a lot of great sources. Uh, and in fact, uh, the clerk of the House of U.S. Representatives um, has preserved a payroll record showing that Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, um, was on the payroll of the U.S. Congress uh, at the request of Congressman Richard Nixon, but really as a courtesy to Congressman Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. This connects Johnson to Ruby. Um, Ruby's explanation uh, as to why he killed Oswald was that he felt sorry for the Kennedy children after the murder of their father. Um, th this is an absurdity, but more importantly, you can go to YouTube and see this now. There is a clip of, uh, of newsreel footage uh, in which Ruby is being led down a hallway 
after his arrest. He's in handcuffs uh, and reporters are shouting uh, questions at him. Uh, and one reporter says, Jack, Jack, how could this happen? Uh, uh, who did this? Uh, and Ruby says, look at the man at the top, the man at the very top. Mm -hmm. They said, Jack, what do you mean? And he says, let me put it this way. If Adlai Stevenson were vice president, this never would have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and at that point, Ruby is squired away uh, and uh, silenced. Uh, there it is right there. Uh, Ruby himself fingering Lyndon Johnson uh, as the as the main perp. And, you know, I think it's interesting, Roger, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this kind of Tucker had done something a few weeks ago when the new documents came out um, talking about the CIA psychiatrist that basically was was treating Ruby. Um, and it's it's very interesting how I guess in, I I'm, would love to hear how you react to that evidence being released recently. It's you know, they were kind of covering the trail in a way. Well, Ruby would die in prison of cancer, um, but only after being injected uh, by government doctors. Uh, so. Um, I, I think Ruby was a loose end uh, that needed to be silenced. Uh, Lee Harvey Oswald was a loose end as well. Now, we are told, as you know, um, that Oswald not only killed uh, John F. Kennedy on November 22nd, 1963, but he also killed Officer J.D. Tippett. Um, there's only one eyewitness who identifies Oswald. Two other witnesses identify a shooter who does not meet the description of Oswald. But here's what we know for a certainty. The spent shells on the ground at the site of Tippett's murder uh, are from an automatic. Yet uh, when Lee Harvey Oswald is, uh, is uh, finally arrested in a Texas uh, movie theater several blocks away, the gun that he has with him is a revolver. So mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, not possible for Oswald to have killed Tippett uh, with that gun. Uh, another loose end that no one's ever been able to explain, but I do reflect in my book, is that uh, Oswald leaves the Texas School Book Repository building. Uh, he gets, uh, by a combination of bus and foot, uh, back to the boarding house where he rents a room. Uh, and during the time that he's in a room, according to his landlady, a Texas, uh, uh, a Dallas police officer's car rolls up to the front of the building, toots the horn twice, uh, and drives away. Uh, we, we still have no explanation as to what that is about. Um, so uh, Tucker has done uh, an extraordinary job of, uh, of peeling back the layers of the onion regarding the Kennedy assassination. The important thing here, I guess, is to recognize that there's one continuous thread. Uh, the people who killed John F. Kennedy, uh, including the intelligence agencies, uh, are the same forces uh, who remove Richard Nixon from office in Watergate. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the same forces who attempted to remove uh, uh, Donald Trump from office uh, based on the entire Russian collusion hoax. Um, I think most of your viewers probably know that I was charged with lying to Congress in order to cover up the Russian collusion hoax. And I, I'm sure you saw yesterday, one of the chief investigators, turns out he was colluding with the Russians. <laughs> yeah, you can't make this, you just can't make, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, the whole thing is, is an absurdity. Uh, the point, of course, is that Donald Trump, who I've known for 43 years, um, is so uncontrollable. Uh, he mm -hmm. is so very much his own man. Uh, he is so deeply committed uh, to what's best for America rather than what's best for any of the big, powerful special interests in the country, that he was an existential threat to the established order. Um, the political insiders, the ruling elite in this country, they had this all figured out. It was going to be Jeb Bush, who they control, versus Hillary Clinton, who they control. Uh, the country would continue to have endless foreign war, uh, the continued erosion of our civil liberties, uh, massive uh, continued debt, uh, the uh, printing press money uh, that becomes more and more worthless, uh, epic uh, inflation, um, loss of respect for America around the world, uh, the erosion of our civil liberties, uh, the downward spiral of America would have continued. They made the mistake of not taking Donald Trump seriously. Oh my God, he's a, 
He's a cartoon character from New York. He's a he's a caricature. Who is this guy? Uh, and uh, they never understood that the American people were tired of uh, dynasties. Uh, they were tired of the Bushes and the Clintons. Uh, they were really tired of seeing America lose. They were tired of the decline in America. Uh, and Trump was kind of the right man uh, at the right place uh, at the right time. Uh, and um, they never saw him coming. They really, um, they underestimated uh, the disgust of the American people with both parties. Yeah. We, reached, we reached a point in America where uh, the American people no longer trusted the Republicans or the Democrats, mm -hmm. no longer trusted any uh, of the institutions. But for the first time, they also distrusted big media. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that had never happened before. It allowed for the uh, election of Donald Trump. They couldn't possibly allow him to get reelected. This is why I continue to believe that the anomalies and irregularities in the 2020 election uh, are evidence of widespread uh, spread fraud in multiple states. Uh, of course, if you say that, um, you will be banned for life. Uh, and a number of media outlets, including Fox, sadly enough. Uh, but it is the it is the sad truth. So let me ask you this, Roger, because I, I think it's, you know, number one, that's the reason I voted for President Trump twice, because he's a, a disruptor and we, we need that kind of a force out there. But observing what's happening with with President Biden right now, like he seems to keep finding classified documents like coming out of his ears at this point. I'm, I'm, you mentioned what happened with Nixon. Do you think that's something similar to what they're trying to do with Biden now? Because I think at the same time, they don't want Harris in there because she's kind of scary. So they'll find a way to replace her and then basically find a way to get Biden out. Do you, do you think that's what's happening right now? Or what do you think of the current situation? Uh, I do. Uh, and I've said this uh, on my own show, The Stone Zone, which you can see every day at 5 o'clock Eastern at stonezone.live. Uh, Joe Biden is toast. When, when CBS exposes him and CNN expands the story. Uh, when Adam Schiff and Andrew Weissman uh, are piling on, um, it's over for Joe. Joe has outlived his usefulness to the cabal. He mm -hmm. is now dispensable. Uh, the combination of the weight of the investigations into uh, his business dealings with his son uh, and his brother um, which is, uh, at the end of the day, not only just corruption, but treasonous, uh, combined with his inability to string together a coherent sentence, uh, combined with the disastrous impact of his policies, record gasoline prices, uh, returning to have to beg the Venezuelans or the Saudis uh, for oil because you have purposely shut down uh, U.S. production of oil and gas, um, epic uh, food shortages, uh, ravaging inflation that's destroying the average family, a foreign policy that is feckless uh, at best. I mean, why don't we just signal the Chinese they can take Taiwan? We won't do anything about it. Yeah. Uh, yet we're shipping billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine in violation of a treaty that we signed uh, in 1994 um, that pro prohibits us from uh, uh, specifically from pushing Ukraine towards NATO, which really means putting uh, offensive missiles pointed at Russia uh, on the ground in Ukraine, which is what this is really about, uh, rather than some demented effort by Putin to, to occupy uh, Ukraine, which frankly, financially, I don't think he could even sustain. So I think uh, Biden's time as president is limited. In fact, I'd go so far as to say he'll be gone by the summertime. Mm. Uh, they, will, they will either force him to resign uh, or if he refuses to resign, um, they'll remove him under the 25th Amendment, which simply requires a majority of the cabinet plus the sitting vice president. Now, for those out there who say, oh, my God, Kamala Harris will be president, it will make no difference whatsoever because neither Joe Biden nor Kamala Harris is running this country today. The country is being run by Barack Obama. He's running it through his uh, right hand people um, until recently, Ron Klain, uh, the White House chief of staff uh, and Susan Rice, the epically snotty uh, national security uh, advisor 
who essentially runs our foreign policy. Um, she did a great job in Afghanistan, by the way. Yeah. So, uh, but those are the people really running the country. Joe Biden is not in control of anything. Now, in all honesty, uh, the person they're going to have problems with here is Jill Biden. She, she is not going to want to go. She really likes, uh, the babysitter really likes uh, her position. Uh, and uh, I don't think he's going to go easily. He's an epically stubborn individual. Um, he's always been stubborn, even before the onset of senile dementia, which I think he is pretty clearly uh, suffering from some kind of degenerative uh, problem. Uh, and look, I, I don't wish the guy uh, uh, ill will, um, but he's not in any condition to be president of the United States. I cannot sleep well at night knowing that his finger's on the nuclear button because he's not all there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I think his days are limited. <clears throat> the the, the the people who've been protecting him for two years have now turned on him with a vengeance. We'll probably between now and six o'clock tonight find some more documents. Um, wait a minute. Didn't he say that Donald Trump's handling of classified documents was irresponsible? Uh, what does he say about his his own uh, handling about that? And I think there's hey, also there's an important there, Jack. There's nothing there, Jack. Well, first of all, my name isn't Jack. <laughs> but I think there's an important note about that, too, though, Roger, because I think one of the, the, the it, towards the end of his term, President Trump declassified a lot of things, and it seemed like the agencies were like, ah, no, we're not going to do that. So at the same time, I think that's also part of the conversation that's needed as well. Were these things that President Trump had even declassified, right? So was it okay for him to have them at this point? Well, there's no question that the president has the authority to declassify documents. Right. No matter what they do tell you, yes, he simply has to say, okay, this is now declassified. There's no form that he has to fill out. There's no filing. He has the unilateral authority to declassify any document. Vice presidents and U.S. senators do not have that authority. So mm -hmm. what was Joe Biden doing with these documents? When they say, oh, it's apples and oranges. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It is. Trump had the authority to declassify Biden did not have the authority to declassify. It is a very different situation. The crimes of Biden are far more serious. Uh, but the question is, will they be held to the same standard? Now what happens, in my opinion, is the efforts uh, by the uh, Justice Department to remove Donald Trump, or at least to charge him with a crime that would prevent him from running again, statutorily, uh, shift entirely to the January 6th narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw the January 6 hearings. Um, I was attacked in those hearings. This woman, uh, Cassidy Hutchison, perjured herself twice under oath uh, regarding me in these hearings. No, I never spoke to Mark Meadows or President Donald Trump on January 5th or 6th or in the weeks before uh, that date or in the weeks after that date. That is a, a lie under oath for which she should be prosecuted. Uh, then they paste together these ridiculous videos taking them out of context, in some cases, I think just totally falsifying them uh, in an effort to get me involved in a matter that I literally know nothing whatsoever about, wasn't there. Didn't go to the eclipse, the ellipse, didn't march to the Capitol, wasn't at the Capitol. Uh, and any claim that I knew in advance about, participated in, or condoned any illegal action on January 6th is, is, uh, is not only a lie, uh, but it's a willful attempt uh, to to vilify me uh, based on their previous uh, attacks on me, uh, because unfortunately, uh, for me perhaps, uh, I'm a villain to many on the American left. Mm -hmm. Here's the good news, and I don't seek this, but I'm a hero to many on the American right for one simple reason. Uh, I was charged with lying to Congress, even though I didn't lie to Congress, in order to pressure me to turn on President Donald Trump and testify falsely against him uh, and thus uh, produce an article of impeachment uh, against him. And I refused to do that. Uh, and for that, they wanted to send me to prison for seven to nine years because I wouldn't cooperate. Uh, it is only because of my redemption in Jesus Christ, um, putting my faith in the Lord uh, and my prayers that President Donald Trump answered those prayers uh, by commuting my sentence and ultimately giving me a pardon. Um, they don't make it easy on you after that. I then had to contend with cancellation. Uh, I'm still banned for life uh, to this day on Facebook, where I had three and a half million followers. Uh, I'm still banned for life on Instagram, which I used to really enjoy. I had about 100,000 followers. The good news is 
I'm back on Twitter, to my yep. surprise. Thank you, Elon Musk. So uh, uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, by the way, I'm at Roger J. Stone Jr., Roger J. Stone Jr. would ask you to follow me on Twitter. Uh, the Twitter space, of course, is a new phenomena to me. At the time I was banned in 2017, Twitter space did not exist. Uh, and they are very, very uh, addictive uh, and uh, hypnotic. Uh, and frankly, I could do one every single day and every single night, uh, but I don't. I do, them, <laughs> I do them very, very sparingly. I do them only when I actually have something I want to say or when I think I can actually contribute to uh, something uh, in the dialogue. Uh, I'd hope to do one with the Gateway Pundit uh, on the 20th. Unfortunately, I had technical issues uh, on my end. To this day, uh, for some reason... Uh, in the architecture, I have trouble dialing into any uh, Twitter space. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I particularly, even if, even if I'm the host of the Twitter space, I cannot get into it. Uh, I still don't have my blue check mark. Uh, Elon Musk, if you're listening, I appeal to you. I'd like my blue check mark. There's a lot of Roger Stones out there who aren't me, uh, but uh, I must say that I'm really enjoying it enormously. Uh, and it has opened up new horizons in terms of reaching more and more people uh, with the truth. Well, Roger, I know you have uh, another interview that you got to get out for, so I want to make sure we get you out in time for that, sir. So for people listening, um, I want people to grab the book because I do highly recommend it. It's a great read. I know I'm almost done with it, but I recommend people get it. It's called uh, The Man Who Killed Kennedy, The Case Against LBJ. So where can people find you? Where can people find that? And also, how can people support you as well? Sure. The best place to go for the book is to go to stonezone.com uh, in the shop, stonezone.com. There you can get an autographed copy of the book. I'm happy to sign it for you. I'm even happy to personally uh, inscribe it to you, stonezone.com. Uh, you can go to my Substack, rogerstone.substack.com to see the latest writings. Uh, uh, and uh, also I'm doing this thing called Stone Talks. Uh, which are bright, brief uh, audio hits uh, of information and political developments. Uh, you can also catch me, as I said earlier, 5 o'clock Eastern every single day at stonezone.live. I do a one-hour show of news, uh, politics, history, style, food, fashion, a drink, lots of drinks. Uh, you want to check that out. And everyone. Uh, also, I, also, I am now yeah. moving to locals at locals.com. Uh, we're going to be doing something called the Martini Hour. I announced that uh, late yesterday. Uh, still in formation. Uh, we haven't scheduled the first one yet, but we will do so. But uh, you can go to, to stonezone.com for all things stone. And for everybody listening, you know, this man really has put it on the line for your freedom. So please do go check him out. Please support him. Roger Stone, thank you so much for hanging out today, sir. Ryan, thank you for having me and God bless you.